Is there anyone in the house who hasn't read Tales of the City? Oh, good. So there's Excellent. new fans all the time. <laughs> Excellent. Have them taken away. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure out if we had to worry about spoilers, but do you have to worry about spoilers it, for a 40-year-old novel? You do. It's, yeah. it's really, it's strange, you do, depending on who's in the audience, you know. I think it might be, we can probably. All right. Let go of the spoiler alert tonight. I'll, 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 um, I'll try to be. But careful. It, it is a really good question because it does happen when, when people stand up in the middle of the room and say, "How could you have done that to Mona?" And and three other people look around and, "What happened to Mona?" <laughs> and then they get really mad. You ruined <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to talk all about San Francisco, but first, before we do that, I have to just say North Carolina. Who knew North Carolina would be letting same-sex couples get I know. married? Wow. Wow, <laughs> yeah. Old Jesse is a rotisserie right now. Here's a secret. It's not a secret. <laughs> I would like it to be, but it's not. Um, uh, that I was a young conservative in North Carolina. Uh, oh, don't start hissing like a bunch Already? of... Already? <laughs> <laughs> I worked for Jesse Helms uh, uh, at, at ES. <laughs> he's dead, relax, he's dead. <laughs> Jesse Helms sent me off on assignment uh, to cover uh, a Ku Klux Klan uh, rally in Raleigh, but he was, he ran the, he was executive vice president of the local TV station. That's how he came to power. He started doing these little five minute editorials where he had a very sugar coated version of, of, of all that is terrible about the land that I loved back in those days. And, um, and so he sent me off to a Klan rally and, um, he was doing a round up the vote. He, no, well, he, he wasn't a senator yet. He was just this mean little guy who drooled out of the side of his mouth in a very disturbing way. And who, I have to say, I, he, he took a very, very avuncular interest in me as a budding young conservative that was both kind and just a tiny bit creepy. Um, but I remember it coming back. Let me just spring onto this story, if I may. Absolutely, it's your it's your day. <laughs> An Imperial Wizard w told me that he uh, because there was a con there was controversy at the time in Raleigh because Dean Rusk's Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, had a daughter who had just married an African American man. It was all the buzz. And. Uh, and I asked the Imperial Wizard what he thought about that, trying to be a provocative reporter. And he said he thought he, that Dean Rusk was a liberal and he didn't see any reason in the world why this shouldn't happen to his family. And besides, what else would you expect from a man who was a practicing homosexual? Whoa. So I came back to the station and when it, I was thinking, boy, I've, boy, I've got a great story for tonight, you know. Completely disconnected from my own reality. You know, fantasizing about men, knowing I was gay, not having acted on it ever, or sex with anybody. And, and I told Jesse that I had this story that the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan just said that the Secretary of State was gay. And Jesse kind of blanched and said, oh, it's not a story, you can't. That's the worst thing you can say about anybody. That's the worst thing, we could never do that to that man, that's the worst thing you can say about anybody. So when you were told by the AP that you were gonna be a reporter in San Francisco, were you just like, jackpot? I, I, yes, I was, I was very excited, especially since they had previously offered me Buffalo. <laughs> Tales of Buffalo. I was, yeah, doesn't quite work. I was living in Charleston at the time, a city that I absolutely love, a beautiful, beautiful, romantic city that has all the trappings of San Francisco in terms of that, of lore and architecture and all those things that cause gay men to settle in those particular areas. <laughs> 
And, um, <laughs> and so when the, when the offer came, and I, I, I went up to New York to interview for the AP. And so I went into this thing, it looked like an isolation booth on an old fashioned TV show, you know, and it was glass all around. And they put me in there with a typewriter and some paper and all of the details of Lucille Ball's recent wedding to Gary Morton, her, one of her husbands. And I had to make it into an AP story. And I wrote, you know, thousands throng the sidewalks as America's favorite redhead, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and they deemed me acceptable and said, we, well, you, you'll get our next opening. So I got a call in Charleston when I was working in the paper there, and they said, uh, uh, we, we're happy to offer you the Buffalo office. <laughs> and I talked to this woman, this old-timey woman in Charleston that I knew, and she said, honey, no matter what they tell you, Buffalo is no place to shuffle off to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, so I, I turned them down, and then they called back, and they said that we, have, we had an opening in the San Francisco Bureau. And um, I had seen it on my way to and from uh, Vietnam and had, you know, tried to see myself there. So how long before you were in San Francisco before you, like, met a really hot guy and got to go home with him? And got stoned with him? Well, I said go home with him, but oh, go probably home with stoned him. is just as important <laughs> in this particular moment. I only asked because the stoning came a little later. First you get laid, then you get stoned. Uh, yeah. Well, first you get laid, then you get hepatitis. <laughs> then you have to go back to North Carolina to live with your parents because you, you, know, you have, need someone to keep an eye on you while you have hepatitis. Um, some things never change. Some things never change. Then you come back and the doctor says you can't drink for a while. And somebody else said, oh, I have just the thing for you. <laughs> and it was. I've preferred it to drinking ever since. <laughs> so uh, I, I sort of have this image of you. I'm, you know, the, you're writing this serialized story for the Chronicle, and I'm, I'm thinking, so are you sort of just running around San Francisco like, looking everywhere you can for details to put into the into this serialized uh, thing? Or is it sort of coming to you? Are people saying, yeah. well, I've got a story for I was you. running around getting laid. You hit it right earlier. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I was just, I was in my glory. I was discovering, uh, you know, I, I found bathhouses when I first got here. And I, I remember early describing them to people saying, it's amazing. It's like a Minoan bath in there. And except they have, you know, nine grain bread with sprouts and sandwiches at the bathhouse. <laughs> that you could eat on the big velvet poof thing in the corner. I thought that was glorious. I didn't think about that being at all icky. <laughs> and uh, They don't serve that sandwich at Blow Buddies. They don't serve that sandwich. <laughs> no. Thank there was a God. time, wasn't there, where we were, when the culinary aspect was removed from the sexual arenas, wasn't it? Yeah, they just cleared out all the sandwiches and put popper's bottles like in a row. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how you know when a bookstore is going downhill, you know. <laughs> when you see the poppers by the cash register, yeah. you know they're diversifying. <sighs> I'm such a bad old man, I should just shut up. No, we've still got an hour, so... Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, talk a little about about how the tales of the city were born in the newspaper for people who uh, remember newspapers in the audience. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, where did where did it start? Was it your idea? Did somebody say to you, young reporter, why don't you give us some fiction? How did it, how did that happen? Um, I the short version. I was writing for the Pacific Sun, uh, which is still there, mm -hmm. um, and uh, doing feature stories for them, sort of around the town column. And a woman friend of mine said you will not believe what happens down at the Marina Safeway on Wednesday nights. <laughs> and so I went down and I observed this, this extraordinary heterosexual mating ritual of the, <laughs> of the women in the rhinestone studded brush denim pantsuits <laughs> with like two items in their cart. 
chatting up similarly duded up guys in the vegetable department. <laughs> I'm told that it still goes on. I've talked to some young people who say they call it date way. <laughs> well, I, but I'm just imagining them there, standing there, you know, looking at their cell phones in the vegetable department. <laughs> But uh, I couldn't write a, a nonfiction story on it because I couldn't get anybody to admit that they went mm. to the grocery store to get laid. <laughs> so um, I made up Marianne Singleton, and uh, in a, in a one-off, Marianne Singleton goes to the Safeway. It's the thing that's still in the miniseries and the, the, with Connie Bradshaw and the carts. And she meets the guy that's, finally meets the guy that's not a creep, and he's there with his boyfriend. And it was sort of struck a nerve in 19, uh, you know, 74, I guess it was. And uh, they asked me if I'd keep on writing it. So I did like five episodes for the Pacific Sun, bouncing around to things that I knew about. So there was like a bathhouse chapter, and, and I had to introduce a gay male character. Well, he was already there from the Marina Safeway. Right. And it started to grow. And then I had always had a, a, an address in mind, a sort of fantasy address that I would write about one day. It was 28 Barbary Lane. Um, and uh, Charles McCabe, I don't know how long to make this story, but it's kind of interesting. Charles McCabe, if you remember the grand old uh, columnist from the Chronicle. Oh, no, just, just dead out there. <laughs> Oh, Charles would hate that. Um, but he was a big, red-faced, homophobic, misogynistic, uh, drunken Irishman mm -hmm. who thought all homosexuals in the world were bad except for me. <laughs> for some reason, he took a, he, a liking to me, and, and he had read the thing in the Pacific Sun and said, I think we need something like this in the Chronicle. So he brought me in to meet the... Uh, you know, the Tyriot family, and um, the whole thing started. And then they started figuring out there were queers proliferating <laughs> in this day-to-day -day column. Was uh, it every day? It was five days a week. Wow. Any writers in the house shivering at that idea of five days a week? I didn't, know enough, to, I didn't know enough to be af afraid of it as I would be now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just plowed in and um, and then let things, you know, things started happening. And then they started coming to me. You know, somebody said, uh, if you think the Marina Safeway is something, you should go to the laundromat uh, down at, uh, uh, it's, it's down in the, uh, in Cow Hollow somewhere. And I went down there to check it out because it was supposed to be a big single scene. And it was called the Come Clean Center. <laughs> 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 and, I, and I, it was a gift, you know. It was a <laughs> right. So it was, uh, you know. Then I'd seek things out. I'd hear that the co -ed, there was a co-ed bathhouse opening on Valencia Street called the Sutro Baths. Co-ed meaning that men and women would go there. I guess it was sort of largely. It must have been a big. It must have been our bi early bi population as well as a certain number of women who just wanted to fix a fag. And I thought, wouldn't that be funny if Brian, my raving heterosexual character, gets all excited about this and goes down to the Sutro Baths to get laid and meets this total babe who's ready to hop in the sack with him. Uh, but, and, and she begins with, how long have you been gay? And he goes to, I'm not gay. It's okay, you know, so there's this whole, he ends up having to scrounge up some experience at camp when he was 13 years old <laughs> to certify his homosexuality to this woman. And I thought, I was kind of proud of having that twist on, that, uh, that sort of twist on things that, that early. Well, Brian is a, a big character um, in the first book and all the way up to the ninth book. I mean, Brian, Brian... Spoiler alert, Brian survives. Um, but uh, I love him. I love him. He's a fabulous character because when I, I just reread the first book and I thought, he's kind of a dick. And, 
and I sort of think of all these characters fondly, but when you actually go back and sort of reread some of the books, you think, oh yeah, they're, they're actually quite complex. And one of the, the great moments is when Brian and, and Mouse, Michael, uh, who are living in the same rooming house, wind up sunbathing side by side. And, and I imagine that must have been a, a very novel thing at the time, to have a, an out gay guy and a, and a non-homophobic straight guy hanging out and sort talking of, in generic terms about going out to get laid. Yeah. And then they go out somewhere where they can both pick someone up. To yeah. Get, well, pick separate people up together. Split up a couple was what yeah. Michael said. <laughs> 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 um, but it was, yeah, it was just celebrating that thing, that thing that sustains me to this day, which is some very tender uh, heterosexual male friendships, you know. These guys, through no accident, also are, you know, great husbands uh, and and uh, to their wives, and um, and I wanted to celebrate that. I wanted to l actually sort of crack the notion, but it was utopian to suggest that the people who lived at Twenty Eight Barbary Lane would never have lived there, for real, because I was saw it happening all around me. Uh, There's a moment where Michael's dating John, who's. Uh, a gynecologist, mm -hmm. and uh, or maybe it's the moment when they're not dating quite so closely. But John goes off to you know what I guess we'd call the a gay group. Yeah. Now a lot of the things in the book seems like they're still very current, but there was something about that moment where I thought, does this still exist? Where there are these sort of wealthy, closeted men who get together, and I mean, is is do you think the closet exists in the same way? Not in the same way. No. Those men still exist. God knows. <laughs> I don't get invited to their parties. Well, uh, <laughs> I called it the decorarchy in the books <laughs> because it was ruled by some very, very, um, you know, high-flown queens of, of fashion and, and uh, design right. who were extraordinarily racist, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the maid would come in and lay the food down at the table, and uh, if they were talking about something they didn't want the maid to hear, he would go, Meaning, Ooh. brown skin in the room. So a character like Michael Tolliver, who's really the, the main gay protagonist in the first book, it, it, was he someone that you uh, modeled after anyone in particular? Or was a little of yourself and a little of friends? And Where did yeah, he come a, from? A little of me and a little of what I wanted to go to bed with. <laughs> I, I spilled it enough to f fantasy to give him life and then used, you know, tried to use some of my own foibles. I certainly didn't. I would never have uh, gotten into a jockey short stance contest. I would have <laughs> in a million years. Um, but uh, I did meet a guy at the Twin Peaks one night, very handsome, preppy guy who was really coming on strong and who when we got to his house, said, you know what really turns me on about you? You're Weegians. <laughs> That's the old penny loafers we wore in the old days. It was like a preppy, preppy signifier. Um, and <laughs> boy, did he like Weegians. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got, we got to his house and he had framed pictures of Weegians on the walls. Just the Weegians, you know. Uh, he had an ad in the advert for, key, uh, for years that said, Bass Weegians. This, this is not news to people who've read the novel because it's there in the novel. And, but the detail that I didn't have at the time that I wish I'd had was that he was the desk, he was the night clerk at the Huntington Hotel, which was the last hotel at the time that would um, shine your shoes if you left them outside the door at night. <laughs> And this guy would prowl the hall <laughs> looking for Weegians. <laughs> wow. I don't know what surprises the owners found in the morning. I can't even begin to imagine. <laughs> and that's your Halloween story for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Costume idea. The clerk at the Huntington Hotel. Did you have a sense when you were writing? I mean, you're writing for the Chronicle, which goes out to everyone in the city. And... Yet you're also writing about 
you know, fetishes and you're writing about, uh, uh, you know, underground nightlife. Did you have a sense of how you were supposed to balance those things or did you just wait for the editors to tell you, yeah, you can't much, do that? Or yeah, I could pretty much waited for them to tell me. So you would push it as, as far as yeah, you could. Yeah, and it would vary it all the time. Oh. And I'd have these ridiculous conversations. What do you mean I can't say shit? I said shit last week. <laughs> that was part of a word. That was shit kicker. <laughs> I personally think shit kicker is much worse than shit, but <laughs> in the scheme of things. But um, yeah, it was a constant mm -hmm. battle with them in that regard. And but I sort of knew, and I ended up using a lot of because I couldn't do fuck as an expletive. I ended up using a lot of of uh, Jesus and God damn it more than I would ever in my own life. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were people who finally wrote and said. Have you got anything against Christians? You know, it was like, <laughs> and I thought it was a fair enough question. You know, like, I'm because of your Calvinist Lord in our culture, I can't say the word fuck, so I have to say the name of your Lord. So I'm. <laughs> <that's> a... <laughs> it's funny how that worked out. Huh? Yeah. So you. Uh, Started out writing, uh, really just following these leads like the Safeway and the Come Clean Laundromat, and then at some point was it like, I'm writing a novel in in pieces, and 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 what was that sort of realization for you? Did did you have to think, oh boy, I got to think about where this is all going, and and those it, it was the computer was adjusted basically yeah. is what happened. Yeah. Uh, by the time I'd gotten to um, Baby Cakes, I, no, yeah, Baby Cakes the 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 English American one, mm -hmm. um, which is the fourth in the series. Right? Yeah, the yeah. fourth. Um, I knew what I was doing, and I realized that it would take like four daily episodes to make one chapter. And I was thinking in terms of both the novel and the daily column mm -hmm. as I was writing. Um, and I had, you know, in all of the books, I've had a real shot at working on it when it was done. It was my first draft, and when people sort of say reverentially, I want to go out and print out all your early newspaper columns, I think, please don't, you know. Right. <laughs> I don't want you to see that mess. Right. Uh, let's talk about um, perhaps the most beloved character in the books, Mrs. Madrigal. Um, I was really interested, okay, so maybe this is a spoiler. I was interested to learn that, uh, that Mrs. Madrigal's identity is not fully explained or revealed in the first volume of Tales of the City. Yeah, uh, you know they all. I think we can. Say, I think we can me. say transgender because I'm. Yes. I'm, bra I'm proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> so in the first book, when you read it, um, she's just Mrs. Magical. She's Anna. Yeah. And uh, and there's this hint that a blackmail plot is afoot. Right. That someone knows her secret, and uh, it doesn't come out uh, right away. But. It was interesting to me that it didn't come out in the first book. Was that a conscious choice? You know, I owe that to the Chronicle, the prissiness of the Chronicle. <laughs> because I told, I said, Mrs. Madrigal is a, a transsexual, I think was the term I used at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, well, you can't, you cannot do that. Not, not the first year. You can't do that for the first year. <laughs> it, here's my favorite part. It will upset the people in the sunset. <laughs> I lived on Russian Hill, but that was kind of frightening sounding, the people in the sunset. They sound like a twilight horde. It, it really, yeah. <laughs> But that's exactly the way that's exactly the way they demonized the readership, and they had very little idea what was happening in the city. When I when I introduced um, when I responded to Anita Bryant the day after she announced her campaign campaign in the San Francisco Chronicle through my character, uh, they were fighting me like crazy, saying, "Why does anybody in San Francisco care what's going on in South Florida?" They didn't even have a dream that you know, we were riding the crest of an enormous movement. Um, and that was my exhilaration. I have to say, I really want to stress that since I've been given this wonderful opportunity by the library. Thank you very much. This is crazy good <laughs> um, to see yourself 
uh, up in a bus shelter like an Amsterdam whore. It's just a... <laughs> it's... It, it's, it's intensely satisfying. I, I have lingered on the Muni platform far longer than I should have, so... How many selfies have you taken with the Oh, posters? just a few. <laughs> <laughs> How do I keep that X-Lax ad out of the side, though? I mean, <laughs> it's been very satisfying, and, and, and I'm most, uh, I'm, what I'm really proud of is that I feel that I have been part of a revolution. I've been a literary component of a revolution, and, I, and I've, uh, that's what's mattered to me the most uh, throughout my career. At the first, it wasn't that obvious because I was having such a good time. Uh, it was just my life. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, having to, have, vowing when AIDS came along to just follow come hell or high water, I kind of chickened out in 1989 with Michael because he was HIV positive and I thought he was going to die. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to write a story in which the gay man died at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, it was, uh, it was a, the most thrilling thing in the world was to realize what I wanted to write a new novel and I wanted to be about a, uh, an HIV positive man in his 50s and uh, who's living in San Francisco today, sort of something that might echo in uh, Christopher Isherwood's A Single Man, you know, because we all love that book, everybody, every writer I know does. And... Uh, and then I realized I had such a guy in Michael Tolliver and that he would be alive. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it was, an, it was wonderful to be able to hop back on board the train after my big share exit in 1989. <laughs> <laughs> you are the share of writers. Like, you've had a hit every decade, right? It's like, <laughs> for like five decades or something. <laughs> I know, I don't think I've been, <laughs> I've been very lucky, I've been very blessed. So let's talk about AIDS because it, it you know, you start writing this book in uh, San Francisco during the golden age of promiscuity and everybody is having sex with everybody else in the first book, you know, it's, it's even to, <laughs> even to, you know, our liberated eyes today when I read the book, I was like, wow, everybody is fucking everybody else in this book. <laughs> That's why it's so warm. The 70s are so friendly. Um, but of course you didn't know. None of, none of us knew that AIDS was coming along. And I'm, I'm not sure what that moment would have been like. I'm a little too young to sort of remember the exact beginning of the epidemic. But uh, can, do you want to talk about that for you? As well, I, it was a single thing in my life, as it is with most of us. In the beginning, when the epidemic came along, it was just personal. It was someone you knew. Or maybe a, a headline on New York Magazine that said the gay plague and had everybody talking. Um, but um, I had a, a little brother in my extended family um, who was uh, 25 and had moved to New York to work for Perry Ellis and was just the sweetest guy. He was loved by so many people. Um, and he got one of the first people to die of pneumocystis pneumonia and went very quickly. And we were just gobsmacked, uh, the people in our little household that knew this guy. Uh, and then, of course, it was happening all around us. We were seeing it everywhere. And um, uh, It's so hard to encapsulate this thing, isn't it? I, it really is. Um, the panic and the, uh, and the fear and the horrible, horrible dread that we were going to lose the liberation we had earned because we'd been found out to be naughty boys and they were going to punish us for it. Mm -hmm. All of the residual Calvinist guilt that so many of us had to shake off when we came from somewhere else um, come, come, came rushing back in the midst of terrible suffering and all of that. Um, so I, uh, I resolved that I was going to have one, a, one of the characters die off screen mm -hmm. and then show the response to it, uh, you know. And it was, if I had, uh, it was my version of the death of Little Nell in Dickens. <laughs> I mean, people were furious. Mm. How dare you spoil my light morning entertainment with your political campaign? 
That's when I realized that so many of my brothers and sisters were not fully connected to their own true good selves yet. You know, that, it was, that we could so easily um, miss that connection. But this was the city that rallied, really. When it, you know, that's when one more thing San Francisco can be proud about. This city really rallied in every direction. The women, uh, lesbians came in and were ready to, you know, to roll in terms of caring for people and um, all of that, so. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, some things are constants, and then some things change, and uh, I just want to read a line from very early in Tales of the City. Uh, Marianne is looking for an apartment. Quote, she wanted a view, a deck, and a fireplace for under $175 a month. <laughs> You're laughing, but I wept. I mean, <laughs> 175 won't even get you a bad hotel room in this I haven't town. got any of those things right now. <laughs> I have a cornice. I've, I've, I'm, I'm getting off on Edwardian ar architectural details, you know. And, but we can do it with everything. I'm rather loving living in our modest abode mm -hmm. um, because it is, it is taking me back to my Marianne years, and I love being able to have... You know, it's the greatest thrill, and one of the reasons that the Castro is so expensive is it offers village life in its purest, most wonderful form. You can get to everything. You can buy what you need. You can, and there are there are many such neighborhoods like that in San Francisco, and we we find them, and uh, and that all adds up to something that makes a city, and was what we were missing when we were in, out living in the most beautiful adobe house in the middle of the desert, the, th the thing we miss missed was that, that dynamic, dynamic. Okay, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Rainbow crosswalks in the Castro, thumbs up or thumbs down? Uh, he, he. They're better than anybody else's rainbow crosswalks. <laughs> I looked them up, the ones in Sydney, in, uh, I don't think they made them take them up, actually. The city council said it was distracting to people. You notice how I'm not answering this question. It wasn't a fair question. And <laughs> the LA ones are big, wide, yeah. humongous things. Yeah, I think it's kind of, I actually used it as a reference point the other day. There were two women from, from uh, Australia who were saying, now, where, where are the bars along here? Where are the stuff? And I said, go down to the Rainbow Crosswalk and walk off in any direction for two blocks. and and then wander out from there. So yeah. Well, they help. They're OK. I don't know. What I'm scared about is the new street lights. They have some sort of festival lighting or something that comes out of. Hmm. So we may be maybe twinkling like a spaceship by this time next week. I have no idea. <laughs> well, things way up at the top. They, they can do rainbows with them, apparently. But I think you can handle lighting because uh, you've been to Burning Man now a couple of times, yeah, right? Yeah, I know. I think we have some burners <laughs> in the house here, right? Yeah. Yes, I love that lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Very becoming. So in the in the most recent book which just came out this year, which is The Days The Days of Animatrical, which is a beautifully written book and oh, um thank you. oh, it's just it's I mean it's so nostalgic because it's announced as the last of them and yeah. and Anna Madrigal is quite old. Um, but this is the book where um, Michael, who now has a, a, a younger husband named Ben, um, is going to Burning Man. And he's sort of dragged there a, in, a, in a bit of a grouchy mood. Is this, is this autobiographical? Just imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's completely autobiographical. <laughs> We're going to need the earplugs for what? <laughs> we have to have earplugs to sleep? <laughs> How close is the rave? <laughs> no, I'm not going on the naked bicycle pub crawl. <laughs> Why not? Okay, one, naked. My big fat white ass on a bicycle seat. <laughs> what was the other? Pub, drunk and naked on a bicycle. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we really did have sort of really comic battles over it. All the while, Chris was just patiently sewing away making outfits for me and saying, don't worry, it's going to be OK. There's a reason you have to have lights on you at night when you ride across the playa. 
And by the time I'd been there for two days, I was already yelling, dark wad, at people that weren't lit. <laughs> I was a, a little bit afraid, and this is reflected in the book, that it would be sort of wonderful, but kind of mean, like a summer camp in the same way, and that there would be rules mm -hmm. and, you know, of that oppression. I'm not very good at communal stuff. But uh, I certainly loved Burning Man, yeah. So you got dragged kicking and screaming the first time, but you went back. So you did find something there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, a, a landscape like you've never seen in your life, we'll never see again anywhere but there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, uh, and it's the land of uh, serendipity. Anything can happen because nothing can be fully regulated. You don't have your fucking cell phones, for starters, so you don't know how to... You have to communicate with people. Sure. And, and that becomes just a great adventure. I would wander out from our RV. Yes, we had an RV. <laughs> oh, there we go. There they are. Oh, listen, the RV is leaking as we speak. <laughs> Put some air in those tires. Uh, see, that's that's what. <laughs> that's the that's, that's the mean the part, burning man. That's you were the mean about. burning man thing. <laughs> Uh, but um, where was I? Oh, wandering out. Um, I ended up. I had have. A, I didn't have a playa name the first year. That's the you know name you give yourself when you go there. And what is your playa name? Mine. I know you've got one. Uh, Pinko. P <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it's sort of a commie Pinko reference, yeah. but also because I just turned, and your coloration when I you just, <laughs> I just turned pink. In That's the me sun. too. Yeah. Um, I called. I I was. I just wandered around looking for sofas. So I called myself Sofa Daddy. Um, and strangely, these there are Swedish sofas. young people. Yes. Oh, we have a sofa. Of course, said the completely naked young beautiful woman with jewels on her everything. On her everything. <laughs> <laughs> on her all together. It's it's uh, uh, it's magical. And I knew it would be great for the, for the book. I used a lot of this in the book. I used Sofa, Michael gets called Sofa Daddy. Um, and uh, because, precisely because it worked the way San Francisco did, that a lot of really varied people could bump into each other in this place, that Mary Ann could go, for instance. And, you know, that there's everything from boho to uh, high tech, and, and, and the twain is always meeting. So I want to veer off a little from the uh, Tales books just for a moment because you've written some other books as well. And um, uh, in fact, you wrote something as a series of magazine articles that, that uh, I had a part in digging out of the archives for you that you've recently republished called Jackie Old. I owe you everything for that, Carl. I'll take everything. it right here. I'll take it. <laughs> I credited you in the forward. I just, I, it was the greatest thrill to have this old piece of... this work <laughs> from 32 years ago, and you stood up and read it at, uh, at a Litquake event. And the audience was laughing, and I was laughing because it, it, I could barely remember what I'd written. You know, I had that distance on it. So it's a great piece that uh, Armistead had mentioned at a cocktail party, and that's, that's when I did some research and dug it out and, and surprised him with it. But he... Uh, uh, he wrote about a, a futuristic San Francisco in which Jackie Kennedy is sort of like a kind of a Grey Gardens character. Yeah, she's Edie Beale. She's, it, I wrote it in 1980, and it's imagining 1999 when Jackie would be, oh my God, Jackie would be 70. The earthquake, the big earthquake, has happened in the city, and uh, people are forced to live in tents in the park. Uh, something that agrees enormously with the gay population in the, in the <laughs> context of this story. <laughs> and Jackie, God, I'll tell the whole story, and then they can't spend $1.99 on Kindle and read Jackie Old. $1.99 on Amazon, people. <laughs> you can afford it. 
Well, it's actually it's like you've imagined Burning Man because there's all these people living in tents in these fabulous, you know, that they've decorated gorgeously. And uh, I've al- I've always been fascinated by those configurations. That's why I did. I mean, that's why the Bohemian Grove intrigued me and significant others, and why I butted it up against a women's music festival called Womenwood. Mm-hmm. Uh, I realized when I was writing about Burning Man, oh my God, it's all the same thing. There are social constructs with certain pressures that people are nervous about when they approach them. Mm-hmm. Another uh, one of your works that I really love is The Night Listener, if anyone is familiar with that novel. Um, and uh, it was made into a movie starring Robin Williams. I understand you got to get close to Robin Williams. Oh, I, I, I've known Robin since the 70s. Really. I've known him since... Pre Nanu Nanu, uh-huh. I knew him. I didn't know that. Um, I had my 40th birthday party at, up at his ranch. He grabbed my little toy poodle and did like 15 minutes with the poodle. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he made the poodle talk. He talked back to the poodle. He had huge fights. He, uh, um, precious and, uh, you know, a, a, norm- a man of enormous intelligence. Yeah. Um, so wonderful to be around, and everyone I know had, had the, that loved him had the slight feeling that they were doing something wrong because they couldn't get him to stop mm-hmm. being on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You yearned for that moment where things were quiet and you could do that. I had a few with him on the set of The Night Listener um, because it's it's late at night and uh, and it's a special little community, a movie movie set. A movie set. But uh, yeah, I was re- so excited when he called and said that he wanted to do it. Yeah. So excited. And uh, and I think he did a beautiful job. Uh, the movie I'm to blame for because I was one of the writers and um, the pressure comes suddenly to, uh, to thrillerize everything. And I knew that the big problem with The Night Lister being a movie is the reason it works as a novel is that there are a lot of phone calls in it. And if you read a phone call in a novel, you picture who's on the other end of the line. If you watch a movie where you're not seeing who's on the other end of the line, you have questions immediately. And that, uh, mm. that destroys a, a major spot. I'm trying to talk about it, but not without giving it away. But I'm very proud of that. Thank you for your compliment about it. I'm really proud of that book. Oh, it's a wonderful book. It's, I really urge people to read it. And uh, um, I want to, well, since you're mentioning movies, let's talk for a minute, and then we're going to turn it over to questions uh, uh, about the wonderful productions that they made out of Tales of the City, where, among other things, the world got to meet Laura Linney, and you got to develop a great friendship with, with her. Wow, yeah, that was one of the big, big blessings of Tales. Um, meeting her and becoming close to her and realizing how alike we are in a lot of ways. That's why she was so instinctive about Mary Ann, because Mary Ann <laughs> I mean, a lot, of, a lot of me goes into that, into that character. Um, and, um, yeah, it was, it's been special with Laura. We were between husbands at the same time. We went, <laughs> we went antiquing together, as <laughs> some men and some women do. Did you go out and try to break up a couple together? No, 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 no. We sat around and we got acted depressed and listened to Amy Mann records together. <laughs> and Amy was, I mean, Laura was so excited when she got to be in an Amy Mann video like a year ago where they, Amy Mann had a robot and it was played by, by Laura Linney. Okay, YouTube. You can find that. it, YouTube yeah. it, Amy Mann, Laura Linney. Um, we're going to take questions from the audience and I think there's someone from the library who has a mic. Hello. Um, so raise your hand, and I'm sorry, what's your name? Jennifer. Jennifer is going to come to you so that you can ask Armistead a question. Here's someone over here. Yes, where did the 28 Barbary Lane come from in, in terms of you know, the idea, that, that sort of space that you always wanted to write about it or set your character's there. Um, well, I lived not far from Macandre Lane on Russian Hill, and I knew a lot of other similar places. I lived uh, for many years on Telegraph Hill, and 
there was havens down there when you go down the Filbert Steps, and I just love the notion of the way this city makes these little walkways into city streets. People carry their groceries down to go home and have to move their furniture down to live there in the first place, but um, I, it just intrigued me, and, uh, and I, so I kind of used, uh, I used McCondry, the visual, the staircase, and then I described it as being where Havens is, which is off of, um, up at the crest of Russian Hill, anyway. There's a little narrow Barbary Lane-like alleyway there. So it's just, uh, I've always had a real a strong sense of home. Um, and, I, and I always loved it when dresses and locales became famous that so much so that you wanted to go visit them. When I was 15, I went to Atlanta with my parents and I said, I know it's fictitious, but where would Tara be if it were here? <laughs> I want to figure out where to whirl my mental skirts. <laughs> I think it's fun to, for the writer to connect with the physical geography of it. It helps you. It's an aid in a way. You don't have to sit there and remember all of Narnia because you made it up. <laughs> <laughs> Narnia is just outside the door, you know. Thanks. Um, when you were talking earlier about um, how they wanted you, uh, the, the Chronicle wanted to, uh, were trying to edit out certain words, um, you know, like shit kicker and, and all the rest of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, did did it go beyond uh, just words, though? I mean, were there episodes or things that you had written uh, that had that you couldn't actually use in this in the series? Yeah, there were. No, yeah. Well, that, no, they didn't get away with it. They tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a call from one of my cohorts in the in the people department, and she said they're going to pull tomorrow's column. This was after the, uh, the, whatever the referendum was in Dade County happened and basically the gay folks lost and Anita Bryant won. I actually uh, talked to people who said, well, you know, basically they were saying time to go back in the closet. Right. I, I asked, uh, I, I was wondering if, if perhaps uh, there were scenes like that um, I'm sure we all would love to read the scenes that were cut out of the... Uh well, I don't know how interesting it would be, but the, the particular line that set them off uh, and that seemed might get most be most offensive to people in the sunset <laughs> um, <laughs> was uh, uh, Michael saying, making basically the speech I was making. I don't care you know, how that referendum went. When I came out of the closet, I nailed the door shut. And that was considered to be pro too provocative and firebrand. It, it's really easy to forget that when I started Tales of the City, um, it was a year after homosexuality had stopped being a mental illness. According to the American Psychiatric Association, I think it was 75 when they took it off the list of illnesses. And, and the, the silence imposed on just being gay was enormous. I mean, I had a wonderful advantage with Tales of the City because I could report on things that people weren't even talking about happening. Randy Schultz came a couple of years later and dug in with a journalistic angle on that. But it was there. It was this beautiful, blossoming, burgeoning thing that you could, you could see. And, uh, and I could, well, the short version is I called up the editor and said, if you pull that, I'm quitting. And... Um, he said, you don't really mean that. And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Hung up and thought, oh, fuck, I've just totally killed the goose that laid the golden egg, you know. <laughs> uh, but he called back half an hour later and said, well, all right. <laughs> and uh, the, I had the power from that moment on. I could pretty much do what That's I wanted. Joan Crawford moment. It was, was it? Fuck with me, <laughs> fellas. <laughs> You know, thank you. <laughs> I just want to hear you say, don't fuck with me, fellas, again. That was just don't too good. Don't fuck with me, fellas. <laughs> the, the sad gay thing is the minute you said your Joan Crawford moment, I, that was the, I knew what Joan Crawford reference you had. <laughs> well, I wasn't accusing you of beating anyone with a wire hanger. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. More questions? 
I'm sorry, I'm gonna do a little spoiler. In one of your later books, um, Marianne and Michael sort of have a falling out. And I was just curious about uh, what led you down that path, because that's always been a story that's really kind of stuck with me, that falling out. You know, it's funny, a lot of that is just psychologically tied in with the fact that I was in my own head, in my, I, was, I knew that I was leaving the story. So I had a storyline that I could sort of psychologically work with because Mary Ann was going to leave San Francisco and go to New York and was thereby sort of deserting her family in more ways than one. Not just a husband and a child, but a best gay friend and all the dynamics of that. And I could, I could so I sort of moved towards that. If the question is, why did Mary Ann... <laughs> oh, the question that I, I never use the word, not in this context, but the question that I'm asked most often all around the world is, why did Mary Ann become such a bitch? <laughs> I take it really personally because <laughs> she, the, she's a part of me. Um, I have to ask myself exactly how bad was she, you know? <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's storytelling. What can I tell you? I mean, we, we are portrayed by our, our friends sometimes. We, people die. Um, we lose our innocence. We, it's storytelling. You, and you, um, it wouldn't... C'est la vie. C'est la vie. That's the answer, short answer. Well, it's one of the things that I really admire about these books and why I think they're so great to go back to and why you should buy some copies out there and support the library is because they really do reveal all kinds of nuances. You think you know the story and then you go back and you see seeds are planted early. And, you know, um, in some ways, you know, you think Marianne's going to become the ultimate San Franciscan at the beginning. And in a way, she's the person who never leaves Cleveland entirely behind. Yeah, that's right. You know, and there are those among us who do that, who don't fall in love with San Francisco, but who resist and go yeah. back home. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, you know, I would like to say that I had all this psychologically parsed out from the beginning, and nothing close to the truth. It's all just fragments of my own emotions and things that I was thinking at the time, relationships I was having. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we were talking earlier about this great uh, Tennessee Williams biography and by John Lahr that's out right now um, and it's really worth the if you just want to climb in with an enormous book <laughs> uh, it's wonderful but it, it he you realize that every crisis in his life everything that ever knocked him off his feet is there in the next play not literally mm -hmm. but the emotional content of what's going on by the time he's got people eating each other alive <laughs> And suddenly, last summer, he's doing it to himself. He's self-cannibalizing. He's used his life and his miseries to such a degree that it's killing him. Rather scary. Well, luckily, no one in your books ate anyone else. It didn't get that bad. Oh, people did eat each other. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. And <laughs> no, and not just in that way. Um, there was a cannibal cult, if you remember correctly. I blocked they that waited, out. They waited. <laughs> that was that's one of the plot lines. Grace Cathedral, um, when the the, the 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 serious high church Episcopalians who are literally taking the the body and blood of Christ too seriously, they're stealing body parts out of a, a local hospital and consuming them on the catwalk. You thought this was a delicate little story, didn't you, Carl? <laughs> you know, the 80s were really fucked up. <laughs> well, I was doing, that was my response to um, all those cults at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, I went into a comedic direction with it and tried to look at it in that way. Um, it came home to roost when we were actually shooting the, the miniseries in, up in Canada, the, the second one in and our French-Canadian director um, said, oh, that was the perfect place for me to be the, have a cameo, was to be the priest <laughs> <laughs> saying the mass. And, uh, and we, I was to wait for the dismembered foot to fall from the ceiling <laughs> and land on the altar. I was to be surprised by it. And I was just doing all these, uh, you know, <laughs> completely hammy. Uh, I've got an actorly bone in my body. I would... 
I had the two altar boys who were both had Canadian Oscars, um, genies, I guess they're called, uh, giving me acting tips, trying to teach me how to. And uh, and they would to make the matters worse. The foot had rubber in it, so it would actually bounce. <laughs> But you, that's, you know, that's one of the, one of the tr trippy things about making something up of the moment and then seeing it uh, come to life. Going out and finding the cliff at Land's End, which is the big climax of Tales of the City, which I'd actually scouted out before I wrote about. And then I could take the film crew back there 17 years later and say, that's, that's where he goes over. I don't think you're a bitch. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> In fact, uh, you're on the top of my fantasy dinner guest list, and <laughs> I have his number if you, if you want. <laughs> and I want to know who's on yours. Oh, I... Who comes to your dinner party, your, your fantasy dinner oh, party? Oh, God, I can't do that on the spur of the moment. <laughs> and most of the ones that I revere, I wouldn't want there. I would, I would, would not like to have Alfred Hitchcock for dinner. Um, uh, but uh, maybe Tennessee Williams before the second Tennis, all. That's a pretty good one. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I. It, it's a. I'd like to. I'd like to have dinner with Jan Struther, the woman who wrote Mrs. Miniver, uh, which was serialized in the Times of London uh, during the Second World War. It was a series of little domestic uh, vignettes that are just. They're beautifully written. It's just a beautiful, beautiful. Uh, stylistically, these little essays just couldn't be more gorgeous to my eye and ear. And, uh, of course, they made a kind of hammy, patriotic movie out of it that won the Oscar with Greer Garson. But she was apparently <clears throat> very small and beautiful and witty, and I think she'd be interesting. Was that a model for you, a literary model, or, or, or were there others as it well? It was. It was one of the inspirations. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Madrigal, it was Mrs. Da Da Da. Mrs. Miniver. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there you, are a lot of those unconscious things. You must recognize it yourself where you have this sparkling line and then you see it in, you watch Bell Book and Candle again and you see that it's a line in there. Oh, I stole that. Yeah. I didn't know it. Yeah. I, I, I remember uh, the first time I heard of your books, I, I misheard what someone said about the character and I thought her name was Mrs. Magical. <laughs> and I wondered if that was the secret uh, subliminal message I was supposed to get. No, it wasn't. But I've had, her, her, I've heard ha, people have said that, have used that since then. But well, she has a little bit of, of a kind of psychic uh, intuition yeah. about things. Yeah. My grandmother had that. Uh, she she was a suffragist in England, and she was the biggest influence on me when I was a, or the best influence on me. Probably not the biggest. I probably took all the bad shit first, but. She was there always. She thought I was the, the, the reincarnation of her cousin Curtis, her bachelor cousin Curtis, <laughs> her extremely artistic bachelor cousin Curtis. <laughs> uh, and she, uh, you know, we were working Ouija boards, and uh, she was very theatrical. And, and a, a lot of Anna's spirit went into her. But she never taped a joint to your front door. No, did alas. She? <laughs> that came Olympia later. did, though. Olympia Dukakis. <laughs> well, she didn't tape it. She gave me pot for my birthday, and I thought, I love this woman so much. <laughs> <laughs> she knew exactly how to be Anna when the moment arose. She's going to be in town shortly, actually. First, I have to say, every time I eat focaccia bread, I think of you. Thank you. Um, secondly, <laughs> I was in the Marine Corps when I started reading your books. And you gave me the strength to get out and come out. And I was wondering, how does it feel to be an inspiration? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> it feels great. I hear it a lot. And I, couldn't, I never stopped loving it. Uh, I never, never stop loving it. I can't think of a better purpose to have had. It makes me really happy. And it was tied up, really, with my own self-worth. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was feeling better. 
I, I, there was nothing. I wasn't selling anything. I was just reporting on, on that joy, you know. Like Still am, or trying to, even in, even at this advanced state. <laughs> well, um, I think we're done. Uh, so let's give Mr. Maupin one more round. <laughs> so much fun.